Okay, roll call. Sissel? Here. Neil? Hi. Carlson? Here. Luce? Here. Zittergruen? Here. Hadley? Here. Johnson? Here. Okay, public comment. We've got two people that are going to provide some reports to us. Um, we'll just go with the first one, the annual report, agency information on Northeast Iowa Community Action. Trish Welkins, you want to step up to the microphone? You may have to pull that down or adjust it, whatever. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, that's oh, better. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I'm Tricia Wilkins. I'm the director of Northeast Iowa Community Action. Um, we're based here in Decorah. I have been with the agency for just a bit over 13 years and been the director for about three and a half. We, um, our agency has been around since 1965, so a long time doing the same variety of services for many years, but adding some, losing some along the way. And, and so what we do is our work is really intended to help those who um, are in need of assistance, whether it be um, emergency services, Head Start, early Head Start, weatherization, it all kind of is, is there to help get people to a little bit better place in their life. Um, like I said, we've been around since 1965. We currently serve Winnishie County, but we serve the six other counties within Northeast Iowa as well. And they're Elmakee, Bramer, Chickasaw, Clayton, Fayette, Howard, and Winnishik. I usually have to do them alphabetically so I don't end up forgetting them. Um, in programs that we have, you can kind of see from your handout, early Head Start programs, we've got 15 Head Start classrooms located within our seven county area. And we do, in, in Head Start, if you're familiar with that, that's a preschool program, um, no cost to low-income families. In addition, we have Early Head Start, which helps individuals, um, pregnant moms, and then infants zero to three. So it's sort of that, that jump from going, starting with our Early Head Start to hopefully a smooth transition into the Head Start program. Um, stable and affordable housing, you're all probably pretty familiar with our housing programs. We've got lots going on here in Decorah. Uh, Willem Mills, Washington Court, and Ridgewood Duplex are all owned by us. And then we've also got uh, apartments in Kelmer as well. So um, some of them are gonna be, they're all gonna be low income. Some are more focused towards disabled. Others are elderly housing, which is our Washington Court. So. Um, we also have um, the low income home energy assistance. When you take a look at the data that I provided, those are the big numbers that you're gonna see. The most households served, the most dollars served, because we serve about a little bit over 3,500 every year in households in our seven county service area, and that's gonna be to help individuals with a supplemental heat assistance payment during the winter. And I say supplemental, and I really emphasize and stress that because it isn't your whole winter heating bill. It is a supplement. It's typically about $400 400 and something dollars for the entire winter season. So we all know here, especially this year, um, it's not gonna come close to covering all of your heat costs. Um, and then we, we also um, have the weatherization program. And one of the things that, that we really saw an increase in was our emergency assistance program. And this is crisis. And so things happen. And so oftentimes we have people coming through our doors who may have a utility disconnect notice, or they might have an eviction notice, or they might be in really big trouble um, with their mortgage payments and owning their home. And so we've had the ability, especially in COVID times, to be able to provide some portion of assistance to hopefully help them get back connected or prevent that disconnect or keep them in their homes um, with other resources too. That's been um, a constant increase since COVID, and we, this is one area, and other areas have have improved, but this is one area we're still not seeing a decrease in. That's certainly one of our higher areas that we see a continued need. And so resources that we receive from our cities and counties and our donors and our federal resources have been really helpful in order for us to be able to keep continuing offering that service and programs. So um, the two handouts that I have, this is um, just our story. So it's just a really quick synopsis of who we are, what we do, who we cover. Um, and then I also, the annual report of it is I try to provide sort of a, a year in review backwards of what we've done. And this is actually going to be um, just a residence for the city of Decorah. So you can see exactly numbers, demographics of those we've served in your area. So programs are gonna be listed out. So you can see when we talk about the LAHI program, 
that we had 175 households served just within the city of Decorah for a total of assistance of about $65,000 or $6,420. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but our crisis assistance, there was over $10,000 paid, 58 households served within Decorah, and that again is a utility, rent, or other emergency type of service. Um, we are also contracted um, with the county, and you can see the Winnesheek County General Relief, there was one household served, and um, that's because we are able to um, utilize so many of our other services to help those individuals with county relief that you rarely see um, the county budgets used um, for general relief. And so that's why it works. We have four counties that contract with us and we've saved them tens of thousands of dollars because we're lucky enough to have other federal funds to oftentimes serve those individuals that general relief would maybe have had to do in the past. Um, this one was for a thousand because the one thing none of our programs or services cover are funeral and that's usually what we're finding is a burial or a funeral for that. And so I'm sure that that's what that was. Um, we also provide the Community Adolescent and Pregnancy Prevention Program. We call it the CAP program, and we're going into um, schools all throughout our seven counties and providing um, scientifically based reproductive health information to our students age sixth grade up to 12th grade. So um, another, another piece that we provide. If you see the buses, you all know we are also the transit region one provider. So you can see that in, for just Decor residents, we provided over 15,000 rides um, for just those living in Decor. Um, you can see the information in the COVID specific programs and those were additional funds. Um, 12 households served for CSBG, which is Community Services Block Grant. Head Start, we had 15 families. We've got one classroom here in Decor. Um, and that pretty much weatherization, we were able to do one home with about $12,000 benefit to that homeowner. And that pretty much kind of, you know, gives you a pretty good idea. And so in total, um, with our programs and services, we were able to assist with over 100,000, 111,000 for just our residents of Decora. So. Anybody have any questions? So the, the males and females on the far, yeah. the top left there? Yep. Those, those are the, that's the breakdown of the people within the households? Exactly, the demographics. The demographic so you, breakdown. Yep, you see the males and the females, and then we break it down. It's just interesting data to see who we're sure. serving, and so it's age groups, races, and then work status. We also, um, you know, we really want to emphasize sometimes the work status to sort of get away of sometimes the stereotypes that go along with people who need assistance. And so you can see that 49 households, or 49 individuals were actually employed full time that still number one qualified for our services and still needed our services. And then on the other side of it, um, we had 57 retired individuals um, who often still qualify for our services as well. Any other questions, comments? Do you have any areas of surprising growth? Uh, increase, increase in need, do you mean? Um, I don't know if I can say we've had surprising growth, but um, Fayette County is has just been an area that we've seen a, a high, high need, especially in the Owine area. So if you were to take a look at the city of Owine and then Fayette County in general, um, you're gonna see lots and lots of resources there. So that's definitely always been a high need for us. Decorah, Winnesheet County is probably one of our lower. Elmiki is a little bit higher. Clayton County is a little bit higher. Um, so actually Winnesheet and Decorah area are probably one of our lower Okay, any other further, further questions? Thank you so much for the yeah. Thank you Thank very you. much Thank for the work you, you do. You guys. Thank I you for coming. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, it'll come soon. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Uh, annual report for Chamber of Commerce, Jessica Rilling. Thanks for having me. Jess Carilling, Executive Director for the Decorah Area Chamber of Commerce. And uh, yeah, we do a lot of great stuff in the town. I've been learning about it myself this year. I <laughs> uh, wanted to focus uh, today's report, uh, of course, with a thank you for your allocation of 17500 um, And what I provided to you is a, a cover letter and then uh, what I would like to spend the most time on today, which is uh, how we serve our um, visitors and residents. Um, it's been a learning year for me, and I th would say that that's been a really big takeaway is 
how um, busy that visitor center and chamber space is year round, regardless of whether there's a pandemic or bad weather. Um, and I guess just uh, probably numbers that you'd be familiar with from past years, but um, you know, more than 8,000 individual connections annually, and I think that that's probably a really conservative number. Uh, we're working to do some more um, tallying during major events, which is often when we would have a lot of people coming in, and it's the most difficult for us to gauge that number. So during Nordic Fest, for example, we serve as headquarters there, and the chamber um, provides administration and a lot of other services for Nordic Fest, and just in a two-day window that we did a tallying, had more than 2,000 people in. So, um, like I said, I feel like uh, 8,000 is a conservative number of uh, humans that we're interacting with one-on-one -on -one during the year and helping, whether that be in person or on the phone. And it's a wonderful diversity. I've decided to start a coffee table book with all the requests <laughs> and questions that come through our office. Uh, it's a surprisingly large scope. Um, for those of you uh, who are new or um, just as a reminder, so the Chamber does own the building. We provide office space for Winship County Development and Tourism, um, Decorah Farmers Market, uh, Downtown Decorah Betterment, and um, I'm learning that we store many things, including Santa's sleigh, <laughs> and a variety of supplies for a lot of community organizations. So really just in a position of uh, serving as a business hub uh, for a lot of entities. Um, I felt like for city funds, it was appropriate for um, those to be leveraged. Uh, we did do a grant application this year to provide baby changing stations in the public restrooms, which I felt like was appropriate, um, and more ADA friendly paper towel dispensers. So um, that was a leveraging of the funds you guys allocated. And, and then just generally, speaking, uh, you would all know this anecdotally and, and maybe also in number, but Winnesheek County is a high, um, has a high volume of travelers. So uh, again, conservative estimates for the people that we are hosting, um, you know, bringing in over 30 million in uh, expenditures annually. So I'm getting a better sense of who that is uh, in my time here. Anglers being uh, a large group that sometimes get overlooked because they don't necessarily come within city limits. Uh, they have plans to go other places. Um, but this county is really, and the community, in a unique position to serve a lot of um, Iowa residents and travelers. So um, that's really what I wanted to focus on. Of course, the chamber also serves our 300 plus members. Uh, in the last year, we've issued 80,000 in revolving loans to small business and um, do a lot of collaboration and leadership when it comes to community events and revitalization. But um, yeah, just really wanted to sing a song about tourism today. I feel like we're, uh, it's, really, it's really fun and it's also at like a surprisingly high volume. So any questions about any of those things? Um, only about um, the hours that are year open now, I'm assuming you're back open like what you had been working before. Have you been able to get your Val volunteers back also? I was really excited about that actually uh, in planning a volunteer open house kind of headed into the fall, uh, just kind of ahead of the uptick of COVID. So we are looking at a, an open house for volunteers just ahead of uh, holiday hours. I think that they'll be able to provide a pretty good resource and obviously like a responsible um, low cost one. We do have quite a few RCP volunteers that mm -hmm. uh, are great about coming in. And I know that during the year that that front space was closed, you know, with, with COVID, um, we've kind of, we've got a gap here. So it'll be reconnecting with a lot of people that have served in a volunteer capacity. And then of course, outreach for people that would like to add that in. Um, but uh, yeah, very, just a very busy space. Right, right now I would say, uh, so the, the chamber's two full-time staff are you know, manning that reception area. Um, and, and what are your hours? Things. We have the lobby open nine to four, um, which has been okay. Um, that's certainly one of the things we look at uh, when it comes to being able to provide a good service for the community and then that balance of providing uh, service for our many business members. And, so. and is that on the weekends as well? Right now we're as, as volunteers are available okay. for weekend hours. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions, comments? Just curious if you've yeah. noticed any trends demographically, like where are people coming from? Are most of them from just Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, kind of the general tri-state area? Are you noticing people coming from other places that you're surprised you, or do you notice any trends or anything? Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty, across the country, I, I sure. would, can say that comfortably, and, and many international guests, maybe more than you would expect, because of Esterheim, Laura Ingalls Wilder, there's some things that pull people from a really far sure. distance. Um, you know, we can track based on the visitor book, but um, also just with communication, and then over the last year, they did a uh, some nice research over which areas we're most likely to draw visitors from. So we know that the Madison area, the Twin Cities, and Des Moines, within kind of that drivable area, would be our some of our biggest pulls for people that are outside of Northeast Iowa. Um, but we we do see people from from every state and many countries. Sure. Um, and so if you want to come just sit next to me sometime, it's just compliments all day long. With the rare exception of people who are upset that the eagle did not get a fish <laughs> while they were at the fish hatchery. So we're working on training the eagles better, but I, I don't have any progress on that to report. So, yeah, anyway, are, are thanks we, for having are me. Are we advertising then in those high density places that we're seeing travelers from or not? Or is it just kind of word of mouth uh, that we're relying on now? Yes. So hotel motel funding would have provided an avenue for some of that. Sure. Um, outside of some of the larger campaign that happened like over the last year and a half, it would be more at like a very like targeted discretion of say like for the holidays coming up, if retailers, you know, pull funds and say, hey, we really want to try to draw from, you know, a certain area, then we would specifically target it. But um, yeah, I think that that's been a good dialogue and a good thing for me to learn too, sure. you know, how much to advertise. Right to ourselves and how much to work to pull people from farther away. It's more expensive if they're sure. farther away. Sure. So. Cool. Yeah. yeah. When I first came on council, re the rebranding of the yeah. with the drift flex, do you have any, any like report or fact check on like how that has changed? Is, is there an, are you seeing more tourism? Is it, what's the impact I guess of that rebranding? Sure. Well, I would say wildly positive. You guys would have probably been on long enough to see the old website. So I did get to see that for a little bit, and it was in um, very desperate need of being uh, redone. So um, I think you know a year out from that launching, we'll have better analytics for it. But the nice thing about the company that did that and the way that they set up the the new setup was really a lot easier for collaboration and for streamlining things. So for example, we're able to take um, like Decor and Now information, events that are flagged as being tourism um, can pull in automatically into the visitor calendar. Things like that that the, the past website was not able to do. Um, so most of the, I guess, like s analytics that have come in to date were more about the outreach campaigns to the metros and not as much about the analytic change for the website. Um, I don't know that there were analytics to compare them to, um, which is important, of course. But uh, I do like that the new one has a much heavier presence of photography. I think that um, information and anecdotally, everyone enjoys that more. So that's been very good. Um, and now that that's kind of done, the point we're at now is looking at how to maintain and keep a high quality of content there. I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, it does. Kind and then, the um, because I have you here, and I, you're on my list to call. Um, the chamber had once, I think, in conjunction with Winnesheet County Conservation, or not County Conservation, Winnesheet County Development, talked about an app, right? Some kind of, and I know you're using DEETS, but is there any talk of anything beyond DEETS on that end? Not yet. Um, it'd be a good conversation to have. One of the reasons we brought Dietz in as kind of a, a little pilot was because the analytics for Facebook now are so poor um, as far as, say, a small retail shop downtown posts something and they maybe think that all of their followers are seeing it. It's actually an incredibly low percentage, sometimes 5% of their followers seeing it. So we're in an interesting place where finally you have a large body of restaurants and retailers and just individuals feeling comfortable with a social media platform right at about the time that it's becoming not the 
greatest one to use anymore. So um, Instagram will be maybe the easiest for like a shift there. Mm -hmm. uh, Deets has been successful in kind of, I would say, as far as a pilot goes. Um, I love that it's introduced loyal to local customers in Cedar Rapids and um, Des Moines to us since we were the first one. Every community that gets added gets connected to us, which is nice about being first. Um, the downside of being first is that it's the newest thing. So creating a habit um, of using that is a lot more difficult. So we've had the most success with it, uh, I would say, for specific events. And that's something that they offered where we were able to do, um, like for Nordic Fest, at no additional charge, just as part of our relationship with them. They did, uh, you know, provide kind of that app service for, you know, thousands of people that mm -hmm. already had the app. Okay. Um, so I, we don't have a separate one identified at this time. Okay. Any other questions, comments? So you've been here for, you know, a while now. Um, where do you see the chamber going? Because this is pretty tourism heavy. It is. Um, and you're, yeah. at, you know, you pencil out at like $2 a transaction, which is great, right? Um, I don't what else can we do? No. Well, what do you... What do you see? Your s yeah. Where do you see the chamber going in the next year? Yeah, it's a good question, a big question. Um, so I worked with a lot of small communities at Decorah size and bigger and smaller. And so a lot of my time here in the first year is figuring out who does what, because uh, that changes over every community. Uh, in this community, the chamber is in a really strong position to do things. Um, you know, we do administration for Nordic Fest, Betterment. Um, we're working with economic development with the city. Uh, you know, it'll be the 100th year in 2024. So a lot of things that can be hard when you're establishing something, um, a betterment group or something, uh, we have that advantage of having a long tradition of work. Um, I think two things. First is that I'm realizing that with the current structure, um, a large amount of our time is going towards tourism, uh, which is great, uh, but if you're doing all that, then there are some other things you're not doing. So that's definitely been an observation this year for me um, with where do we put energy for serving our membership. So I would say retail and restaurants absolutely benefit from us having good open hours, from having visitors be able to come in, having an outdoor kiosk, coordinating all the publications, um, answering the phone, all of those things, like wonderful service to residents and visitors. Um, and kind of a, I feel like we're like dispatch in some ways for all these things that people could call about. The chamber is kind of that, we'll call them because they know everything. So, and I learn a lot over this process too, uh, right? Citywide garage sales and which city department and what's the landfill's name? I can't find it on Google. Uh, so as soon as everybody figures Google out, we're really in trouble. Um, <laughs> but a lot of time there and it's time that I would not want to give up. I love the service there, right, to those 8,000 people. Um, we get really positive feedback. It seems very, very worthwhile. The challenge is, is that we have, a, we're blessed with a large manufacturing sector, healthcare, right, like a lot of other membership. Um, and I think they're, they've been at a disadvantage um, a little bit. So uh, that's definitely something we've talked about internally. How do we do all the things without losing the most visible piece and the piece that is may, maybe most easily criticized, right? Are you open or not? I'm calling, why aren't you answering? You have, you know, these two people, I need help right now. <laughs> so, you know, but to do some of those big impactful projects that we would love to do, and I think the chamber is well positioned to do, um, we have to figure this piece out. So um, that's a long answer, which is to say, I feel like the chamber can do some pretty awesome things, many of which you guys have visioned yourselves in assessments and, um, and in conversation. Uh, and so it'll be a matter of having the capacity and how to do that. Volunteers help. Not being in a pandemic helps the volunteers. <laughs> so, you know, I feel very optimistic about the, the way forward, but we're figuring it out. Because like the website, for example, you know, the, the headline banner on the website, at least in the mobile app. Yeah is the chamber golf outing on June 22nd. Yeah, it was great. 
Yeah, it's right? over. Um, <laughs> so that's my question, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Is we spend a lot of energy on Visit Decora to answer your question and not on okay. the Chamber's website. But I agree, that would we'd so be best served by updating. Is it, would it be better? Because mm -hmm. to back to Emily's point about rebranding mm -hmm. you know, and focus, that's kind of where my head is. Like, um, I, I'm happy to have that discussion uh, yeah. at some time, and I look forward to it. And I'd love to hear more about where you see things going in the year as we evaluate communication and um, and websites and how to best uh, reach out. Yeah, I was looking at past years for the chamber allocation, and it's been I think it was sixteen five for quite a while, and then in twenty sixteen or seventeen it went to seventeen five. I was surprised there wasn't a change when you lost your full time tourism person, because that's certainly the space where the burden of tourism um, didn't change. In fact, probably increased, and so I'm the chamber was happy to keep that viable, I think is really important for the town. But right. but yeah, we're kind of at that place now. Right? And I, I don't know about you, so. Mayor, but I've heard feedback from former, not docents, but volunteers who felt disenfranchised after COVID um, mm -hmm. and haven't come back. And I think having people on the weekends would be really beneficial. Um, having staffing? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, staffing, whether it's paid or volunteer, yeah. would be very beneficial because clearly that's when our that's when our tourists are here so if there's any way we can support that and and mm -hmm. help with communication please please reach out to us because I think it's yeah. important I think that'd be great so weekend hours are we're busy on the weekend the town is yeah. I agree so. any other comments questions thank you very much yeah, I think I went over my, ran I said, Randy, do you just want me to talk under 10 minutes? And he said, yes, keep it clear and concise. And then here I go. Thank you guys very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Is there anyone who has anything else that needs to come up for the council that is not on the agenda? Seeing none, we'll go on with the consent agenda. And I'll let um, Travis work with that. Item A, minutes of the October 4th, 2021 council meeting. Item B, claims. Do you I want me to elaborate on why the list is shorter? That's correct. Okay. <laughs> I like so, to hear your approach. <laughs> this is what I want to hear. So uh, we did stop talk at the department head level as well. Unless council takes exception to this, we'll probably see fewer items on the consent agenda than the council has in the past. I'm not saying those items that would have otherwise been there are gonna have a 15, 20, 30 minute explanation behind them. It may only be a minute or two, but I think that there are some items that if we keep off the consent agenda, provide a minute or two background to further discussion that it may be beneficial. We'll still see some items in the future besides just minutes and claims in the consent, but not for today. I'd move for approval of the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion? When would it be the appropriate time for feedback on this new new way of doing things? <laughs> you just want me to send you an email, or or do you want you want to hear? That's certainly up to you. I, I I don't know if this is the appropriate time for Let's council thoughts. What's that? Let's I I just That'd be a question for the mayor. I, I think the idea of providing more background is great because that's right in line with what it seems to be a lot of our priority for better communication with the public. If we can just tell them, hey, this is this is why this is an obvious move for the city. That's that's good. It it helps our media make sense of our consent agenda. I think that'd be good. Um, I I think that you know if if we have to have a roll call vote for all of these things, um, may, maybe maybe we just allow for there to be some background for the consent agenda, and then we have the roll call vote. As last council meeting demonstrated amply, we don't mind pulling things off if we want to discuss them. Right. So my personal preference would be that we leave those things in the consent agenda, but then have time for background uh, where you can just go through and, and give, give people that background. That, that's just my personal preference and uh, take, take that for what it's worth. Well, I think too that sometimes there are things that actually should be on the regular agenda that have gone to the consent agenda and then we start, you know, there has to be a discernment so that you know what needs more conversation. And I think that's what you're saying as far as what's on the consent agenda. And if it needs more conversation, it should be coming to uh, the regular agenda. Correct, like for example, we've, we have had a lot of conversation around a consent agenda, which by definition should simply be read and then voted on. 
that's the whole premise behind consent is these are all items that are so routine that involve no conversation whatsoever one motion and they're all approved so in the in the future like I said this list will be a little longer in the future but we're probably going to see fewer items than in, pa in the past okay well I think you know as we go along too we can uh, see how that translates into the amount of discussion that council feels is appropriate I can definitely see what you're saying as well could you just cite a few examples Travis of things that you've seen on the consent agenda that you thought maybe shouldn't have been like liquor licenses or like I'm just curious as to what you think maybe needs more discussion that you've no those uh, liquor licenses which we didn't have a renewal for any this month sure. so those will typically appear on there uh, items for example some of the resolutions that I've seen placed in the consent agenda that uh, well prime example is anything this council has pulled off of the consent agenda in recent history so if you believe that it's going to result in conversation it shouldn't be placed on there sure okay, okay so we've had a motion and second in discussion roll call schissel aye neil aye carlson aye loose aye zittergruen aye hadley aye johnson aye Issuance of requests for proposals RFP for community catalyst grant application. And I'll let you work with that. Yes, so included at the dais for all the council members. I got a few extra copies here for anyone that might be interested as well. Uh, the community catalyst grant is a program offered through IEDA that first and foremost does require the city be the applicant. So that's why we're having this conversation here uh, myself as well as some others from the economic development portion of the community were asked to look at a building with a proposed project they emphasized these two grants that they wanted to seek again requires the city to be the applicant I'm very familiar familiar with community catalyst I've applied for this twice when I was in Humboldt uh, I don't want this to sound like I'm discouraging by issuance of the RFP by any means but one of the components of community catalysts, I'm emphasizing that, is you have to make the argument that this project is going to serve as a catalyst for economic activity within the rest of the downtown area. In my twice prior in applying in Humboldt, I was told Humboldt's downtown was too vibrant. Vi Humboldt has a fairly vibrant downtown, not a vacant storefront, all on Sumner Avenue. However, I'd be remiss if saying if it was more vibrant than Decorah. So it is, and the individual that I spoke with about their project is well aware this is an uphill battle. Not saying it's not wor one worth going after. But, so what this RFP is, is the city's way of saying we're willing to apply for the Community Catalyst Grant. What projects exist out there in the community? Because again, this is one project that I've discussed with it's possible that that's not the best project out there and that another project could be identified and we could submit that one I've had that conversation with this this one particular project but what it also does is if it's the only one that comes forward it will help them score higher in the community catalyst grant at IEDA because the city went through a competitive process to select them for application uh, I will point out Community Catalyst does require, at a minimum, some level of local particip from city participation financially, but it can be also in kind. So for example, we could, at a minimum, waive uh, building permit fees, and that could be considered the city's contribution. There is no local match required. However, the more match provided does result in a higher score. This RFP here is simply to find out what projects are out there for us to consider. I would recommend a, a scoring committee that is comprised of those in the economic development area, as well as our, our chair of economic development, uh, myself as staff, and uh, we can go on from there, but I would propose a five, myself, Steve Luce, uh, Jessica, Stephanie, and why am I drawing blank? I just said it before. Laura Friest, thank you. Please, nobody tell her I drew a blank <laughs> on her name. Is she, 
How much of the city resources, I mean, so here, you, what I'm hearing. Yeah, I know, don't tell me. <laughs> is a grant that seems like a long shot and a lot of city resources. So one of the components of this is Laura actually had a conversation. Laura was part of that conversation with this project. She is actually willing to assist with the project that's awarded. And I say assist with, they're not gonna solely write the grant on their own, but it's actually, I'm going to hit submit if ultimately the city does select a project and apply. Because again, this RFP does also stipulate the council can say, you know what? None of these projects are worth our time in theory. Uh, the RFP does say that. So the council does not have to move forward with anything at this point. So you wouldn't be involved in any of the writing? I would have to probably hit copy paste off of a Word document and then hit submit through iogrants.gov. And if how many is this um, this one is available how many times is it like once a year once a year once a year okay this has been a, been a pretty successful program through IEDA okay. uh, not successful for Decorah's or, or Humboldt's but uh, again it's a they allocate a million dollars on an annual basis however they have consistently awarded more than a million dollars in grants I believe last year was 1.8 million in grants that they offered. This does seem to be, uh, Debbie Durham at the state level, uh, it seems to be one of her key programs that she really seems to enjoy awarding projects for. And the, the in-kind match from the city can't be time, your time? Probably not. Well, I think it's an, an opportunity for projects out there that want to at least try to get some funding for what they're doing and the city can assist econ for economic development to be able to uh, work with them in that fashion. Mm -hmm. And this, this program, Community Catalyst, does have a pre-application and then an application. So it is possible that the pre-application gets filled out, they see City of Decorah and score it, I believe it's, it's like five points, really is all required on the pre-app, but we might only get four. It's possible that any applicant with any project would be at a disadvantage where we wouldn't even get past the pre-application stage. Yeah. And so how do, how do potential people that want to use this, how do they find out about it? So of the handouts that should be at everyone's see at the dais, I do have a cover letter that's drafted that I would give to the Chamber of Commerce, Winnesheet County Economic okay. Development, uh, even local banks, or if there are businesses that even call, we'd send this information off, but there is a, those, each packet associated with the two different programs. I mean, I think it's, it's an awesome service we could provide, right? I hope that there are other grants that we could do this with that might be more successful. Mm -hmm. And I would hate to see too much of your time when you're just trying to get onboarded uh, into this only because of where you are in, in starting. But I really like the idea of the city help helping businesses and catalyzing. It seems seems like a perfect opportunity. So I guess if you think you, I mean, if you feel like it's worth it and you have time for hit and submit and whatever else, you probably aren't. You know how we all say we don't. It doesn't take much time, but it does. Mm -hmm. Like if you're feeling that that would work. I think it would be a good tool to help us assess mm -hmm. what interests or what needs different partners of the community true, are yeah. have out there. And so I would move that we indeed offer. That's a good thought, I like that. I would second it. So we have a motion um, to offer this to the public and a second. Uh, motion made by Luce, seconded by Neil. Any further discussion? I'll just say it, uh, you know, if the opportunity is out there, you can't win if you don't play. Yeah. Right? Right, and you never know who's gonna, maybe right. there's not a lot of applicants this year. And the other nice thing would be if you do apply this year, at least you have basically the template to, to apply later next year, right? So, yeah. Yep. So and we gather data that are parties that are interested, like Steve said, you know, that if it's not this grant, maybe it's another program that we can work with. And it starts to build an inventory of interested people who in downtown or or opportunities that we can, right. we can work with together with, with uh, you know the economic development scoring team, so yeah, I th I'm I'd be supportive. 
And I think it's cool that there was an individual that really is interested in at least trying to work with what they have downtown and be able to improve on it and was willing to even bring it before us. So, okay. Travis, do you know if this would be limited to the C3? Yes, that is a requirement of this is it must be in the downtown C3 district. Thank you. Okay, that being said, roll call. Luce? Aye. Neil? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Zittergruen? Aye. Hadley? Aye. Johnson? Aye. I'll say aye too. <laughs> Chisel. <laughs> I had to come back up to the top line. <laughs> okay. Issuance of request for proposal for RFP for downtown housing grant application. Okay, so this is the second packet. They look very, very similar because why, re why reinvent the wheel? However, this one is very, very specific that it must be a residential project with a focus on upper floor. A rear main level is eligible, but as indicated by IEDA, who again, this program is through, would not score nearly as well as an upper floor residential. Again, the same project that I spoke to and talked about um, indicated that they wanted to apply for Community Catalyst, identified this mm -hmm. program as well. This is a first time, I'm going to stop short of say one and done because this is uh, ARPA funding, the American Recovery Funds. It's $20 million, $20 million that's going towards this program. A project can be eligible up to $600,000 depending on the number of residential units they would create. If they create 10, uh, more than 10, it's 600,000, less than it's 300,000. This one I believe has a much greater chance of being selected than Catalyst. And so this one, um, knowing council support for the first one, I would strongly encourage that we approve this RFP as well. Again, it's an RFP process. There is no um, obligation on the city's part, and I'll take it one step further. There is actually a local match of 25% required, but that's not required to come from the city. That can be private investment. Can, it, is this directed at workforce housing, or it can be any type of housing? It cannot be Airbnb if that's what you're curious well, about. Well, I was curious, <laughs> I was actually curious about Airbnb or, uh, you know, it, it Super, actually, uber awesome, I don't know. So there are amenities that must be provided as part of the, the project. Okay. Uh, at a minimum, or for example, on-site laundry. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the unit. It could be on-site as part of an overall, but it, there are certain amenities that are required. It can't be basically just a uh, studio apartment with basic amenities. So right, I guess what I'm saying is, you know, can they charge a rent of, you know, $2,000? I mean, yes. And do we have any say when we offer the RFP that we would give priority to the ones that we would work with that would actually look at workforce housing? So there is a scoring matrix that I did provide as part of that RFP. There could be any change. These are all draft, of course, until council approves them and awards them. So on page three of the downtown housing does have the scoring matrix. If you want to adjust any of those or make sure that anticipated rent as part of it, we could certainly put that in as part of the scoring matrix. I would like to add that scoring in. Um, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't fund a project otherwise, but I guess in my mind we need workforce housing. Um, and so I guess I would like to see that we at least put it within our scoring matrix for projects that we decide that we are going to move forward with. And say that again, what you'd like included. Um, I don't know how we would word it. I would be open to wording, but I would I would rather us, if, if we've got projects of equal merit, I would rather us focus on a project that's going to provide workforce housing as opposed to one that's going to provide luxury housing. I've got it. Workforce, word, workforce housing. Workforce okay. housing got as it. opposed to luxury housing. Okay. My I would probably suggest placing it within project impact. That subsection, that's a zero to 15 points on 50 points total scoring matrix. So if we were to insert uh, you know, some way of wording cost of rent to be charged at the end product, right. that's probably the best 
place. Okay. I would move our approval of this submittal uh, with that addition, uh, the impact aspect of the scoring matrix. I don't think we should limit the, um, the impact based on workforce housing or any other kind of housing. I think, um, I think we should have any project that, it, that will increase the taxable valuation considered. But it would, uh, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't not consider it. I'm just saying that we you're, you're closing the door on, you know, oh, lots of different kinds of housing other than one. No, and what I, I was trying to, what you're trying to, I, all I was saying is that we could have a score on it. So that if we are considering two impactful projects, right, that if you are, if you're killing two birds with one stone, so to speak, so providing housing, but also dealing with our workforce housing issue directly, you're going to get a little bit higher points than someone who's offering luxury housing. We have housing for, for people who can afford it. What we're looking for in is more affordable housing. So it seems to me, we, I'm not asking that we don't consider projects that don't have it. I'm just saying we give them a bump. Maybe it's a point or two. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so I have a motion from Luce. And we do have an interested party in this particular program. Now, would that scare them off? Or, would that, or is that not what they're looking to do, to your knowledge, for what Emily's suggesting? I don't believe it would scare him off, as, as Emily pointed out. The way I understood the motion made in, in Emily's comments is it would affect the scoring slightly based on the rent they would charge. It's not going to eliminate them from applying. Correct. Okay. I second. Uh, seconded by Zittigruen. Any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call. Luce? Aye. Zittergruen? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Hadley? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Chisel? Aye. Neal? Aye. Uh, consider Ordinance uh, 1282, approving the 2020 redistricting map. This Mayor, is this. Mayor, there's one uh, on item seven we haven't done yet. Oh, shoot. Issuance of a notice of airport consultant. Thank you. So this is essentially an RFP as well. This is a requirement by FAA that can either be done on a five-year basis or on a per-project basis. This notice to airport consultants puts it out that Decorah Municipal Airport is looking for potential projects in the future of which we're gonna need an engineer. We have to go through this competitive process to be able to get FAA reimbursement, and that's, that's huge, because that's 90% for most projects. So we have to go through this process either every five years or on a per project basis. This does not obligate the city of Decorah to any of these specific projects in the notice. This is simply put in there as part of the CIP that was already approved that this is anticipated these projects are going to happen within five years. Yes, they are associated with five years as part of the CIP, but this does not obligate us by any means to do a project or do it in that time frame. I would move the council give an issuance of request for proposals or for airport consultants. Sorry. I, I wondered. <laughs> Second. Motion made by Lou, second by Carlson. Any discussion? Hearing none, roll call. Luce? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Zittergruen? Aye. Hadley? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Schissel? Aye. Neal? Aye. Okay, now consider Ordinance 1282, approving the 2020 redistricting map. This is the second reading. I move for approval. Second. Moved by Johnson, second by Carlson. Any discussion? Heard anything from anybody on it? Nothing written, nothing verbally to I myself. I, I'll just note that um, one of the unfortunate things that's, that's happened as a result of us timing the process the way we've chosen to time it is that uh, the first Google search result for uh, City of Decor Ward maps uh, is the new proposed map and not the current one. Um, which might sow some confusion among voters, especially more tech savvy ones. And so I think it's critically important, especially I'm looking at, at our press who are here and, and online, it's critically important to make sure our voters are looking at the current ward map and not necessarily the first thing they find on Google. If you have any questions, you should 
called the city clerk. I actually don't know if that's right. The county auditor county might be auditor. A, <laughs> county auditor, the might county be auditor, right please. person. Um, I also, I know in my conversation with Kate at the newspaper, said that it was really important that they have all the precincts in the paper that are current because of all the discussions for the maps as well. So. And ho hopefully multiple times through the process because people aren't really keyed in until they're going to go vote. Mm -hmm. And voting's open now. Um, it was my biggest concern. And unfortunately, I think it's coming to prove. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, um, I would echo that, and I would love it if media would print it more than once or at least keep, keep it in the forefront of people that there's an old map and a new map. Yeah. And you should vote on the old one. I would move approval of the second reading. We already yeah, have a motion. We have a motion and second. Yeah. Um, any further discussion? Roll call. Johnson? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Zittergruen? Aye. Hadley? Aye. Schissel? No. Neal? Aye. Luce? Aye. Okay, consider ordinance 1281 proposing city code changes to chapters 10 and 12 seasonal parking restrictions, snow emergencies, and snow removal policies. This is the first reading. I believe I'll have you give some background on that if you could talk about this. Yes, yeah, so this considered a first reading again because of the conversation that happened at the last council meeting. Uh, there were some proposed changes that were more than just verbiage they were actually content so um, I, I apologize I'm gonna have Jeremy take a lot of this as well because I wasn't able to be present at the last meeting but uh, I believe all of those comments have been taken into consideration ordinance drafted by John uh, with working with Jeremy on this yeah so the uh, there were three main differences from the ordinance proposed at the last meeting the first one um, is that the time frame for the alternate side parking would start November 1st and go through April 1st the second is that we change the effective time uh, so 2 a.m. to 5 p.m. instead of 8 p.m. reasoning for that was um, it hopes to make it a little more convenient for folks coming home from work to just have to park in anticipation of the next day as opposed to having to go back out later in the evening. And lastly, um, added some language of prohibiting residents from depositing snow on an adjacent property or the right of way in front of an adjacent property without permission from that property owner. Okay, I have a question for clarity. Um, when I look at uh, 1052-290-A, um, it talks about no one shall park or leave standing in any vehicle on the street at any day between the hours of 2 and 5, and then it has an exception. As here and after provided, can you explain, and Travis did, but I want this explained in public, uh, 1 and 2, as when I look at that, it means, sort of goes back to that old even odd parking? Yeah, so in, in simple terms, what this is saying is that between the hours of 2 a.m. and 5 p.m., alternate side parking is in effect. From 5 p.m. to 2 a.m., it is not. Uh, so <laughs> go a little further into it. The I know what your question is, Mayor. It says in A, item A, it's not allowed. And then the subsection is except, and then it talks about the alternative side parking, odd days, odd side, even days, even side. So we have to have, and, and John, correct me if my explanation isn't what you agree with, but we have to have that language in there that the street parking is prohibited to be able to issue uh, tickets, fines, or tow in the event that it is so extreme. And then the exception is what uh, we have to focus on for compliance, if you will. But we have to have the language in there that it is prohibited during that time frame to be able to issue those tickets instead of imposing that these times are not okay and explaining it within greater detail 
we say it's just not allowed except when it is. So during the day, that it is not affected during the day. It's during the hours of between 2 and 5. Correct, but between the hours of 2 a.m. and 5, okay. you are required, you have to fit within the exception. So odd days, odd side, even days, even side. It is worth noting, we've had the discussion at the department head level that mm -hmm. our emphasis, especially this first year, is going to be education. Uh, that, that will always be the case. We will emphasize education. There are going to be, I'm not gonna say we're not going to enforce this ordinance because there may be situations, whether it's an extreme snowfall or education has failed. Um, <laughs> so there, I'm not saying we're not going to enforce this at all mm -hmm. by any means, but we will emphasize education first. We're well, talking like the ordinance has already passed, but just give me a couple of minutes here. <laughs> um, so the, um, the, the time between five o'clock and 2 a.m. Or right. for that time period, are we gonna run into an issue where there are cars on both sides of the street in any area like it'll still be that for streets that only have one-sided street parking like how do we handle this the streets that only have one-sided street parking so that a car could still get through if it was snowing we weren't plowing and there are two cars on the side of the street you know what i'm saying what the scenario is So I'm just curious, so you know what I'm saying? So if you have a street that really only can allow for one car, it's not a wide street. So these are our narrow streets. So if our narrow streets wind up at seven o'clock at night and you've got a storm <laughs> and two cars parked because someone hasn't moved their car, will a car be able to get through? But two cars may not be able to pass at that one spot. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that happened in the committee discussion and then in the, pre the council meeting that happened after it, I think Emily was pushing for a November 1st date. Well, only because the, uh, the chance of a storm in November was pretty big and if you had overflow parking in Thanksgiving and a storm, wouldn't you want it moved? So just for a point of clarity though, in the, I was gonna say just for a point of clarity though, when you were having the commission or the committee meeting, it was December 1, right? But at okay. the council meeting, yeah, we did last yeah, we time. Did. Last, last okay. Okay. Yeah, last meeting okay. we talked about all of these changes. This okay. is a reflection of a council meeting discussion. Is is the motion on the floor yet or not? I mean, <coughs> no. well, then I think we should just all move on. <laughs> I'll make a motion to. Now I got to read it. <laughs> um, I make a motion to pass the ordinance to. Uh, I'm not good at this. One 1281, two. proposing city code changes to chapters 10 and 12, seasonal parking restrictions, snow emergencies, and snow removal policies. I'll second. Motion made by Neil, seconded by Luce. Discussion. I have something to say. Um, I, I, uh, I actually am really grateful for the change to 5 p.m. I think that's a really good move. If this ends up passing, that's gonna make things uh, maybe a little bit harder for the street department. I think it'll make things a lot safer for elderly people who will then be able to move their car when it's light out. And I think it will make things a lot safer for young children whose parents won't have to choose between leaving them sleeping in bed without a parental supervisor while they go move the car across the street or who will be woken up in the middle of the night for no good reason. So I, I, I commend that change and I think it's good. I still don't support this ordinance. I think it casts too wide of a net yet. 
Uh, I don't think it's responsive to the facts of our local climate, uh, and I have a couple safety concerns. So I'm going to go through it quickly because I mean <laughs> this is all the, uh, the this is a this is a, a meeting that could have been an email, except Iowa state code makes this illegal to email about. Uh, so I'm going to have to talk to you here. Um, the first the first reason I think this casts too wide of a net is that uh, we don't have that many snow days. We have um, many winter snow days, but compared to many places where there's just effectively no parking, we have a fairly mild winter, uh, a, m a winter that's increasingly mild given uh, climate change. Um, and I, I think we, we should take that seriously. So I, I looked up days of snowfall in Decora, um, and there's something like 30 to 35, depending on who you ask. And we're talking about restricting, now 30 to 35 days in which there's any snowfall, uh, measured snowfall. That's more than a tenth of an inch, I think, more than a trace. Um, and I, 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 you know, I think that maybe we're casting too wide a net to uh, change people's parking uh, rules and laws, change the way we use our streets uh, for an event that only happens one out of every five days uh, during the winter, and that uh, on those days when it does happen, uh, oftentimes it's not severe snow that requires rolling the plow. So I'm, I'm actually curious, uh, and this isn't a question yet, Jeremy, but you certainly, I'd love to hear your thoughts after this. Um, I'm curious how often we roll the plows and in what months, um, because the second reason I think that this casts too wide a net is that I think that starting November 1 uh, and ending at the end of April uh, doesn't reflect what I've been able to find out with my very amateurish research on the weather, uh, which is that the great majority of snow days in, in winter in Decorah happen after December 1 and are done by the end of March. And so I think we should consider rolling this back to be uh, less expansive and, and representing a, a narrower uh, time frame. So um, I'm going to so the, the, average, just the average November has 2.3 days where it snows at least a tenth of an inch. The average uh, April has one day. Um, so you're talking about 3.3 days there total. Um, the next closest is, is, uh, is like seven days where there's a tenth of an inch. So I think, that, um, I think that maybe November and April should be removed from this. Uh, that would make it more palatable for me, I think, and better for the citizens of Decorah. Um, and I want to talk about the safety concerns very briefly. Obviously, there are safety concerns on the part of the street department, on be, you know, in, 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 on, on behalf of people who will benefit from having streets that are better cleared because of this proposed ordinance. Um, but uh, when we effectively increase the width of our streets, which this ordinance does during the daytime uh, in the winter, we're signaling to drivers to go faster. That's how drivers respond to wider streets. Uh, and, and we are effectively widening our roadway when we do this. Um, and I'm concerned that, that when drivers are going faster, especially in the winter, when their stopping distances are shorter, uh, we create hazardous conditions for people who are using our roadways and streets as pedestrians. Um, and so that's, that's one safety concern. And uh, the other safety concern is still that even, even if they can do it at 5 o'clock, not everyone can do it at 5 o'clock, but even those who can, we all know that it gets dark really early here. And so asking a lot of the people in Decor, especially a lot of the vulnerable people who don't have off-street parking, that's a disproportionately represented group in those who park off-street or, or people who are, who are vulnerable. Um, I think having them cross the street in the, in the dark, four nights out of five when there's no snow on the ground, is, uh, is casting too wide of a net. So, you know, never, never criticize without proposing a fix. Here's my proposal. I think we go back to the drawing board and consider how we can do a better job of communicating to people when we're declaring a snow emergency so that the 30 times a year that we do it, we say, everyone park on the outside of the streets. And then the next night, we send everyone a Decora text, everyone park on the even side of the streets. The technological hurdles are pretty high for doing something like that, uh, but it's one that our school system's already cleared. Every parent in Decora gets a phone message um, whenever there's a school closure. And I think that we should consider looking into that sort of a system and making this responsive to local weather and not something that we just do every night whether or not there's snow on the ground. And I'm gonna circle back to say the one last thing that I forgot to say, because I was skipping around on my notes, which is that even when it does snow in November and in April, those are milder months. And the vast majority of the time, it's not a you know perduring snowfall. It's not gonna be ice on the side of the road for, or for a week, because those are milder months, and usually the, the, the snow and ice will melt. So thank you so much. Sorry about taking so long. So what, I, I wanna respond to the time frame, because I've come up twice. I, you're, it ends April 1st, right? 
So we usually do get quite a few storms in March, just from my own tracking as a teacher and how many snow days we have, but hold on. Sorry, I'm I sorry, I was wrong about that then, thank you. Okay, I mean, I do think that the notion of November, even if we didn't get any snow in November, we wanna train people before the snow comes, right? So there's, a, there's an advantage of starting in November that gives us this training time of people moving their cars. Um, I think I hear you in terms of, it, it's not perfect, but what we have right now isn't working, right? And I, I think we need to fix it. And I do think that this is a good stab at a fix. Um, and so I think we should try it and hear these things. Some of your concern to me are greater concerns. Like if we have people in the winter using our streets as uh, walkways, I think that's a greater concern that this policy shouldn't be looking at, but we should be looking at why are people walking in our streets in the winter and fixing that problem, regardless of there are two cars or one. So I hear that, and I, I think we should look at that, but I don't think that this is it's gonna be made worse by the policy, it's already a problem, right? Um, I do think other communities in Iowa do this. It's not that we pulled this out of a, a hat and said like, But decor is, is better. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll just say I'll just say I'll just say this: winter is winter, whether it starts November yeah. one or December one. And if we get a big storm in November, which is it, which can sometimes happen, then you're not you're not protected. You're not you're not following your own rules during winter. Yeah. This is a rule for winter, and winter can start in October sometimes. We can get 10 inches of snow in November easily. We can get 10 inches of snow in March or sometimes even April. Um, and the rules are going to be the same whether, you, whether you're living in December or living in November. And, and ice is actually, to me, more problematic, right? I mean, so we get more ice because we get less snow. So I guess I would rather give our street department the chance to clear ice really well as well. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not just snow, but the amount of sleet, hail, all that nasty stuff that if we don't get it off our streets well, provides an unsafe environment. And the final comment I'd just make, Steve, just because this is fun, <laughs> is um, <laughs> this is what council meetings should be. No, just kidding. It's just that I think the demographic that you're interested in reaching is our hardest demographic to reach. It's, you know, every parent has a cell phone, but does every elderly person in Decora use theirs well? And so I, I think we need to have the conversation of how do we reach our citizens? We, oh. communication is one of the number one priorities many of us share as a, as a council. I don't know that we're gonna get that figured out in time for winter. And I think we owe it to our street department um, to be able to figure out a way that's gonna make our snowing of, our, our removal of snow easier, less time consuming, safer overall, and gets people in the habit of kind of moving their cars if necessary. They have to move them once a day anyway by law. So now we're just asking them to move them at a time that works as well for our streets. That would be my. I would say I support the the right because as I the rewrite as I read it, it covered all of the issues that we addressed at the last council meeting and covered them as they were discussed. What was discussed is now here. And, and Did you not hear anything I said at the last council meeting? Because the rewrite didn't address a lot of my concerns. So I'm just going to take objection to that characterization. Um, well, the last council meeting, thanks for your input. Appreciate it. It's the, it's the armchair quarterback. Uh, it's the last. It's the last. It's, it's feedback at the last second. Um, we did have, we did do this in Randy six, Kirk, six street committee meetings, four street committee meetings that we've done this. Um, we've had staff, staff, and PD uh, feedback over multiple times. And, and we have, um, and, and we've amended it to reflect the last council meeting. Um, not necessarily all of yours, but other people's input. So uh, I take objection to the thought that it's not, uh, that it's somehow out of right field. Um, but I do hear you about communication. And that's not written in here. Uh, it's not an ordinance. Um, it's a goal. It's a goal for us. And I, I think we all need to accept that goal uh, as a challenge uh, to, to, com to do a better job of communication. And then tying it back, if you didn't feel involved in the process, I know you. I know you're always invited to the committee meetings. 
Um, so you're welcome. I, to I've been to every streets committee meeting since I was elected as a council person. Okay. I think. Well, then it's clear that and, and every time I've we have a disagreement. Well, and that's and that's good, and that's why. I, but but this is the best forum for me to give voice to this agreement to a wide group of people. Sure. And and this is just my job as a council person, uh, even though yeah, it's it's fully baked and it's obviously looking like a done deal. Um, but I've been critiquing the process along the way, and I want to be consistent. Sure. Well, the one thing you've got is this is an ordinance, and so you've got three me. Yeah, three, three readings. readings. Yeah. Um, and so I guess what I'm looking for from the council is I don't think we've had any motions or seconds. Yeah, we have a motion, yeah, and, we have a a motion and a second. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. I, I do want to say Steve has brought these all up, in fairness to Steve. He has been he has In been both committee and in council meetings. Yeah, so okay. I, I don't repeating. appreciate the sense that I'm sitting here throwing this uh, not, at, at the last second. Okay. Uh, roll call. Neil? Aye. Luce. Aye. Hadley? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Schissel? Aye. Carlson? Aye. Zittergruen? No. Okay. So the first reading passes. Uh, city manager, department head, and council reports. So we already touched base on uh, the council agenda, and there, we're looking at some ways to take the feedback from all the council members, from staff, and implement some small changes to kind of, to kind of build on uh, goals, as I believe Ross pointed out, goals that have already been established. And we've already identified a couple of policies at the staff level that uh, we'll be working on to bring to personnel committee or budget and finance. and. So we're probably gonna have some more committee meetings in the future on some different policies that uh, have seen amendments, but I, uh, I think the grounds in which they were developed, that technology has advanced and that these policies maybe don't reflect current technology. So we're looking at a couple things that we've identified internally as far as improvements to efficiencies within our own operation. Can these be brought into work session? They have to be brought into committee meetings. I mean, we have work sessions every month. Yes. It seems like these things. Mm -hmm. So it can go straight to workshop. I'm, I look back on history as to how they were handled two years ago. For ex one policy was amended two years ago that um, still needs further amendment. And it was handled through budget and finance and then a recommendation to council and then an approval of council so it can go to a work session if it, I don't think this one's gonna be that in depth that it warrants a full council discussion at, I, I do believe a co committee discussion and then recommendation to council would be sufficient for some of these. We didn't, ha the only reason I said we didn't have full work, I mean we really only started this once a month work session back in February. I mean we haven't had it even for a year that we've done work sessions once a month. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's a matter of looking to see what it, yeah. you know, bringing it according to when you're working on it and letting, us, letting them know you can determine whether it has to go to committee or work session. And, and, I'll, and full disclosure, we're not talking anything earth shattering at this mm -hmm. point. Uh, like I said, we're trying to make small changes, improve efficiencies, mm -hmm. and build on some potential other things that have been identified that might be a little bit larger in scope that are going to Can I make a small workshop. ask, a small change ask mm -hmm. while you're looking at policies? Can you make the agenda 16 font? Because to me, it's looking like it might be 10 or 12 and- No, that's eight. Um, <laughs> I'm a- I agree you with You know, that. <laughs> if, if we're trying to be communicative and inclusive, I didn't bring my bifocals. <laughs> I can't read this. Mm -hmm. And that's so. why I missed that one. Yeah. I, I I that exactly. So that, that, would be my, that would be one of my process change asks, that okay. the agenda be a larger font. Okay. Noted. At least 24. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, along those lines, we have uh, talked about at staff, as well as some of our external partners, a lot of our, our stakeholders, if you will, if there's ever been an opportunity for change within operations to be discussed, now is probably that time. Uh, 
with both myself and Carrie relatively new in our positions. Now's the time, I, I don't want to say provide influence, if you will, but if there are things, you know, even talking with some county affi appointed officials on the way things have been handled in the past operationally, they said, well, you know, it, it would make our job a little easier if you would do it this way as opposed to that. Don't do it all at once. Um, the housing abatement program is a great example. In talking with uh, the county assessor, Jim said, you know what, instead of approving an entire slate of them in you know, October, November, all by December, as they come in, you can get them off your desk and get them up here, and then I can begin the work on them and, and telling them all. So in years past, they've all been slated, all done in right. once. That's right. In theory. In theory. Yeah. yeah. So. And then there's some that come up. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that is an example of an item that would find itself on the consent agenda as single items, as long as they're meeting the requirements of the residential tax abatement program there would be no reason for the council to not approve them so they would find themselves on the consent agenda one at a time in slightly larger font. <laughs> <laughs> slightly larger font. Okay. Uh, other than that, I'm continuing to meet with various community members. I've, I've gotten through, you know, tours of all our, our facilities and everything. Again, I cannot emphasize enough this community's welcome. My family, we just closed on a house on Friday. I have to share this. My wife, when coming back from picking up the, yes. the kids on Friday from school, had a neighbor girl writing sidewalk chalk in front of the house. So when she came up, uh, the neighbor girl wrote, hi, welcome to Decor, or hi, hope you like Decora. And wrote it so it was facing the house as you walked out. So uh, the community's reception has been amazing. Uh, several people stopping by and saying hi, even if you stop by City Hall which is kind of like a second home at times, uh, <laughs> feel free to just stop in and say hello. Mm. And we're hoping that tonight you don't have to hit the floor when you go to bed. Maybe you can get your regular bed. We've got a committee meeting after this. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, are, you, are you done? I'm done. Carrie. Hey, just Carrie. Okay. just last week was a week well it was basically just a blur but it's been great department heads have been great um, and the end of this week I will be leaving Wednesday afternoon and will be gone the rest of the week to the IMFOA um, conference in Des Moines so that's and Iowa Municipal Finance Officers Association and uh, it's it, we're just getting used to making sure we have all the postings up and all the stuff out and so we'll continue to make sure that that's all in place as we go forward to the next meeting. Uh, Jeremy, if any, or anybody else? Just real quick, we had a new officer start today. His name's Cody Emel. He, uh, um, from the Austin area, he's gonna be great for us. He's firefighter one and two certified. He's an EMT, so he has a lot of experience on that as aspect of it. Um, I think he's gonna do well, and we'll plan on having a badge pinning for him next council meeting. Very good. Thank you. Fantastic. Anything else from the departments? Hearing none. Randy? I have nothing this evening, Mayor. Emily? Um, the Sustainability Commission meets this Wednesday. Be meeting with Travis. Um, other than that, happy birthday. And I think I'm good tonight. We will be, um, we will have an opening on the Sustainability Commission since yep, we will. one of the members is choosing to be a lifelong learner and go back to school for a while so uh, Andy we have a utility meeting after this if anyone wants to join the Steve's and Randy and myself okay Steve um, Andy can you share anything about deer hunting in Decorah are we oh, yeah. 
doing anything in the parks this year or yeah, yeah I guess I'll just comment on the parks period that's and sure. the park board did uh, we discussed it a couple months ago and they are allowing um, limited hunting in the parks so by limited and that they need to work So an archer would come to the parks department and figure out how to sign up for the process and take. You're okay. <laughs> that would be a good spot. I live right across the street. You could bag quite a few deer up there. Maybe we should put one there. Our parks for so the decor only hunters. I mean, like only hunters could be there for a weekend. What about an alternate park ordinance? I believe I have the floor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just just a minute. Oh, we're just having. Okay, yes. So, the, what would the appropriate uh, venue, or how would a homeowner give an archer permission to use the ordinances assisting in Decora to do archery hunting during the archery season? I know it's not in your department, but. There's city, is, is there city uh, definitions as far as that's concerned? Uh, I think we've looked, we've had to look at this I before. Think we've had and to, uh, too. the city code only really eject, uh, addresses firearms, but if you theoretically shot your arrow and it went into the neighbor's yard, right there, there's going to be an issue. Okay. Um, and then there's a whole other issue once that deer start is hit in your yard and starts running through all the neighbors' yards, mm -hmm. um, of of tracking that down and whose it is. So, it's possible. Uh, I don't know if it's encouraged, but uh, so realistically, John, you're saying it's probably not going to be legally done in decor. Oh uh, no, there's cir circumstances where I think it could be legally done. Uh, but uh, every every lot is different. I mean, we've got ex right. some lots that are extremely small, and then we've got some lots that are uh, an acre or more with a lot of timber. And in some of those, it could be perfectly legal uh, to do it. But I think it should be done with caution, <laughs> uh, oh, sure. depending upon the circumstances and the location. We've had conversations about deer deprivation before and how to do it and how you know, we couldn't get them a census because they stopped doing the flyovers and, and various things. And so I, I guess I asked council, what is our game plan? What are we going to do to be able to deal with a significant problem? I mean, it's fun. My wife and I always go, oh dear, <laughs> because we're looking out our window again and that's what we see across the street all the time, those three. Um, but the neighbor says, 
they are a nuisance in her yard all the time. I mean, we do have a significant deer population in town, and we've got to figure out some way to make amends to the problem. It is, it is actually within the sustainability plan, so when we talk about strategic planning, we, my understanding is it had been looked into the past and was very cost prohibitive in terms of sharpshooters. Um, but it is within our sustainability and land use management. Um, Andy worked with us to help write it. We haven't looked at it because it wasn't a year one priority. Um, but it, it is certainly, I think, within the next year a priority and, and assigning how we want to do that. We would want to work with parks to figure it out, but I think you're not the only one thinking that it's a problem. Yeah. Maybe when you go, you know, bring it up when you go to the sustainability, you know, yep. meeting. And yeah, and say, they will, they will start to prioritize that plan based on when we have our strategic planning as well. Yeah, so they you know. they want direction from us as well. Yeah, that's right. I attended the last uh, downtown betterment meeting, and I'll be attending Wednesday morning, the next one, in terms of encouraging them to continue looking at the downtown assessment report that we've been issued. So that's in the agenda coming up for me. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Steve Luce. It's Steve Luce. Yep. How about Steve Zittergruen? I think we should give Steve Luce another go. Uh, I want to <laughs> thank my fellow council members for the spirited discussion we had. Uh, it's, it's okay when we disagree. It's, it's, it's because we all want what's best for the people we serve. Um, and good ideas are strengthened, not harmed by criticism. So thanks for the discussion. Uh, the second uh, thing I want to talk about, uh, this, this is related actually to the discussion we had earlier, but it wasn't germane because uh, it, it wasn't a counter argument or anything about this particular ordinance, but I think it's something that we ought to think about if we're seriously contemplating an ordinance that shuts down a whole lane of, of a lot of our streets for five months out of the year, then maybe it's something we ought to think about the next time that we're plotting how big we want our roads to be and how wide. I mean, if we can live without them for half the year, um, then maybe they're wider than they need to be, which of course represents money coming out of our taxpayers' pockets. Um, and that's just... Uh, I didn't know where it was appropriate to say that, so I just said it right here. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that the Decora Food Pantry, uh, on which on, on the board of which I sit on, uh, we are hiring a new director, a full-time, uh, well-compensated position. Uh, we, we are going to competitively uh, pay a nonprofit director to help lead us and, and run the organization. And so uh, this is a well-connected room of people, and there's well-connected people listening. So if, if you... I can think of someone, or maybe you are the someone, although I'm not trying to hire away your staff, Travis. Um, <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, but but I, we, we, can't, we, can't, we can't compete with what the city's paying anyway. But uh, we, we, uh, we are looking for the next right person, and if there's someone in your network of contacts that might be appropriate, uh, please do consider them to encourage applying. Um, I say that because the Decor Food Pantry is part of this community's uh, support network for our most vulnerable citizens, and so it's important that we have a good director for all the people of Decorah, not just for the, the food pantry and for the people they serve. Thank you. Thank you. Ross? Um, okay. I, got no, I got nothing today. That's okay. Thanks. It's okay. Kirk? Uh, just a little, I guess, a little update from, from where I work at Luther College. Uh, we've had two successful homecomings. Our, our uh, most recent one this past weekend uh, was a little bit smaller crowd than, than we might have expected, but it was a good crowd, and people had a beautiful weekend to, to celebrate together. Uh, just a reminder, we have one more, I think, big weekend coming up in two weeks when we celebrate the commencement of the class of 2020, a year and a half late. And... Uh, Word on the street is we have about half the class coming back, so it's going to be you know quite a or half I should say 250 people or more coming back. So that should uh, uh, and I think more will come as as time goes you know forward. So it'll be another big weekend, and just thanks to all the uh, retail establishments and and bars, restaurants, and others who are catering to our visitors uh, who are coming back to to celebrate their commencement a year and a half late. And then what weekend is that? Last weekend, last weekend of the month. Okay. Okay, uh, let's see. I, I went to the airport commission meeting. I love going out there with those guys. So it's mostly Greek for me, but it's a lot of fun to see what they're doing. And every time I go, I, I appreciate the airport that we have because of the uh, viability that's uh, and uh, the usage that it's getting. Um, also, just another reminder, uh, we've got great uh, candidates that are um, for this election season, season in many different races. 
please get out there and get to know your candidates and who you can vote for. Uh, you can always call up the auditor's office and they ask for sure which ward you're in and who, who you should be voting for. And then uh, make sure you get out and vote. Um, and then on October 25th, we'll be having a work session. We have not had put anything on that just yet, but we'll work to, sounds like we've got some things that we can put on it, so. Any other work to come before the council? Um, I did have a question raised that maybe Brent can answer. Is um, official trick or treating night Sunday the 31st? <clears throat> I don't think so. Yes, it is. Is it? Yes. Yep, official trick or treating. Historically, we we talked about that and kind of looked in the past. Historically, it's always been on Halloween. That's what I thought. Sunday. I get a lot of questions about that. I think I've, I wonder if I didn't read it on the paper that they said Saturday the thirtieth. So we better double check that, or they better double check. I, that. I know the police. You read in our paper doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I know the police department did push it out through Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, through their social media page. Okay, that sounds good. Correct. Well, that's, that's when it should be celebrated. Okay. Now, hopefully that's what they're working with. Okay. Thank you very much. Move for adjournment. So moved.